Hello and welcome to Topic 3 Lecture, and in this lecture we're going to be learning about gender equality and the United States Constitution. Equality is a key component of American political culture. When we use the term political culture, what we're referring to is the beliefs and values that bind a people together as a nation. And all nations, all countries have a political culture. If you've ever traveled abroad, you know that the values that are held in other country, countries can be slightly different and sometimes significantly different than the values that define what it means to be an American. Um, and so when we think about American political culture, we think about our emphasis on rule the people, democracy, uh, a loving of, of, of individual freedom and also individual responsibility. <clears throat> and also obviously equality is a key component of American political culture. Um, the concept of e equality and liberty are, and democracy are all embedded in key American documents, including the Declaration of Independence. And probably the most famous line of the Declaration of Independence is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights. It almost goes without saying that the United States hasn't always lived up to the ideal of equality for all. And when I think about the failure to live up to that ideal, what comes to mind is the I Have a Dream speech that Martin Luther King made in 1963. In that speech, he says, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. <clears throat> when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. I love that sentiment in the speech because it, it, it it's basically uplifting in a way of saying that there's this promise and our society, our government needs to make good on this promise. And American history can be viewed as a fight to make good on this promise of equality. And that's true too for gender equality. Um, and so this week we're going to be examining the fight for gender equality. As noted, the principle of equality is central to American values. However, prior to the Civil War, the word, word equality or equal does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. Yes, equality is in the Declaration of Independence, but the Declaration is a political manifesto, not the supreme law of the United States. The Constitution is the supreme law of the United States, and prior to the Civil War, there is no direct statement in the Constitution demanding that government treat people equally. This changes with the addition of the Civil War Amendments, in particular, the 14th Amendment. And so following the Civil War, there are three amendments that are added to the Constitution. The 13th Amendment, that abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment, which is the amendment we're going to be talking about because it has to do with the equal protection of the law, among other things. And then the 15th Amendment, which forbids denying the right to vote on the basis of race. The 14th Amendment contains many different provisions, but we're going to focus on four clauses in Section 1 of the 14th. Before we dig into the clauses, I want you to keep a couple of things in mind. First, I want you to keep the historical context in mind. The 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution to make sure that the rights of people in the United States were protected. Most importantly, the rights of former slaves, the rights of African Americans. The, the 14th Amendment is telling state governments what they cannot do because there is tremendous concern that former Confederate states, when they come back to the Union, are going to take away the rights of Black people. The 14th Amendment makes this more difficult for states to do. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is that the clauses, while perhaps initially added to prevent discrimination on the basis of race, have been used to expand the rights of all Americans, including the rights of women and members of the LGBTQ community. So here are the four clauses that are in section one of the 14th Amendment. The first clause is known as the Citizenship Clause. It basically says that people who are born in the United States are citizens of the United States. 
um, that citizenship is not given to you by the state that you live in, but that if you were born here, then you are a citizen. This is in the 14th Amendment because there was concern that some states would say that former slaves were not citizens um, because they were former slaves. This prohibits that behavior by a state. Uh, the other clause is known as the Privileges and Immunities Clause. It basically says that um, there are certain privileges and immunities that citizens of the United States have and that no state can take those privileges and immunities away. So you're a citizen and you have these fundamental rights. Um, the Privileges and Immunities Clause has been used to expand rights for women. In particular, it was used when women were seeking the right to vote. Uh, they said that the right to vote was a privilege and immunity that was granted to all citizens and women were citizens. But the court rejected that argument. They said that the Privileges and Immunities Clause um, refers to the privileges that are granted to um, former slaves, uh, the, the right to work, uh, the right to trade travel freely, um, the right to just basically exist and pursue happiness. And so there's a very limited understanding of the Privileges and Immunities Clause, but it was used by women in order to um, get the right to vote, even though it was used unsuccessfully. Uh, the Due Process Clause, uh, that there's a Due Process Clause in the Constitution, in the in the, in the Bill of Rights in the Fifth Amendment. Um, but then uh, this due process clause in the 14th Amendment is giving instructions to states. The Fifth Amendment is an instruction to the federal government. The, the 14th Amendment due process clause is an instruction to states. Basically says that states cannot deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. As we're gonna see later in the semester, the due process clause is extremely important for um, rights that are related to gender and sexuality. Um, that that word liberty has been used to say that there is an inherent right to privacy in the Constitution, and that right to privacy it includes the privacy to make reproductive decisions, such as using contraceptives and, and also um, the right to an abortion. Uh, that, uh, that the, the Due Process Clause also provides for sexual autonomy as it relates to um, the, the, that states can't prohibit certain kinds of marriages or certain kinds of adult sexual activities. Then finally is the Equal Protection Clause. So keep those other clauses in mind as we move forward in the semester. But for this uh, lecture, uh, that it's the Equal Protection Clause, basically telling states that they cannot deny people the equal protection of the law. So let's look at that clause and ask ourselves, what is the equal protection of the law? So what is equal protection of the law? Well, according to Cornell Law School, equal protection forces the government to govern impartially, not draw distinctions between individuals solely on differences that are irrelevant to a legitimate government objective. So for example, race and voting. That there are some legitimate government objectives that are in play when it comes to elections and voting. We obviously want people to not vote more than once because that kind of violates the principles of democracy. You wanna make sure that all the votes are counted and that it's counted in a fair and transparent manner so that it can be evaluated. All of those are related to a legitimate government objection. However, not letting people vote due to their race, well, how does that relate to making sure that elections are free and fair and transparent? It's not related to a legitimate government objection, uh, objective. Race is an immutable characteristic. You can't change it. You don't choose it. Plus, race has no reasonable relationship to other aspects of being human. It doesn't have anything to do with your intelligence, your ability to choose a good candidate or, or anything. It's the same as eye or hair color. And so when it comes to the equal protection of the law, uh, equal protection of the law prohibits discrimination. It prohibits treating people differently without reasonable justification, okay? So the question is, is how do we know whether different treatment is re reasonable and therefore constitutional? Or on the flip side, how do we know whether different treatment is unreasonable and therefore unconstitutional? Who answers this question? Who decides what is reasonable and unreasonable different treatment. The Supreme Court of the United States is the body that all answers the ultimate question about whether or not 
different treatment in law is a violation of the Constitution or not. In other words, it's the Supreme Court of the United States that interprets the Equal Protection Clause and applies it to laws that are treating people differently and deciding whether or not that different treatment violates the Constitution. And to do that, the court comes up with particular tests or standards that it uses when uh, adjudicating Equal Protection Clause cases. Some types of differential treatment are assumed to be unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. A good example of that is racial discrimination. When laws treat people of different races differently, that the court assumes that it's a suspect classification and they give it extremely close attention and just assume that those kinds of laws are unconstitutional and, until proven otherwise. Um, the reason that race is considered a suspect classification in the United States is because race, as I mentioned the last slide, is an immutable characteristic. You don't choose it, you can't change it, and that it has no reasonable relationship to human capacity. Furthermore, the United States has a long history of unjustified discriminatory treatment, right? And so in light of that long history, um, that laws that differentiate on the basis of race are, are considered suspect. Um, so laws that discriminate on the basis of race receive special attention from the court. What they receive is strict scrutiny. Uh, and what that basically means, and you'll read more about these standards, the different standards that the court uses when it comes to deferential treatment in law. Um, that, you know, strict scrutiny uh, it basically says that for the government to engage in differential treatment, they must show that this different treatment is related to a compelling state interest and that it's narrowly tailored, that the, the only way that's compelling or paramount interest of the state can be achieved is in a very, very narrow way. The burden is put on the government. They have to prove why this law is related to a compelling state interest. Um, most uh, 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 laws that differentiate on the basis of race are, are considered unconstitutional, but not all. Affirmative action is related to a compelling interest of the state, um, remedying past um, uh, discrimination. And so some affirmative action laws have been deemed constitutional by the Supreme Court. Most other sorts of differential treatment is assumed to be constitutional by the court. Treating people differently based on age, income, physical ability, etc., are not considered suspect classifications like race. And that's because one's age, income, physical ability can have a reasonable relationship to human capacity. So take, for example, age and voting. It's reasonable to say that you have to be 18 years or older in order to vote because you being an adult gives you a certain capacity to make decisions um, that allow you to be a more informed voter. Three-year-olds, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds do not have that same capacity, at least in general. Eyesight and driver's license, that's reasonable because you need to be able to see the road in order to be a safe driver. And so it's reasonable to have uh, physical, uh, to differentiate between those who can see and those who cannot see when it comes to getting a driver's license. And even something like welfare, right? That, uh, that it's reasonable to say that you have to meet a certain income threshold, right? That you have to be below a certain income level in order to receive welfare because welfare is there to help somebody who doesn't have the capacity to potentially help themselves because they are poor. And so if you're poor, then it, it, it impacts your, um, your, your uh, human capacity to a certain degree, and then you get assistance from the state to help you take care of you, yourself, and your family. Laws that differentiate between non-suspect classes receive a lot less scrutiny from the court. Remember, suspect classifications receive, receive strict scrutiny from the court. Um, uh, classifications that are different treatment that is based on non-suspect classification, uh, the court uses what's known as the rational basis scrutiny. And what the rational basis scrutiny says, as it says there, like anything goes, it's pretty easy to find a law to be constitutional if the court employs the rational basis scrutiny standard. Um, that the different treatment must be based in a reason. The different treatment can't just be mere hostility to a particular targeted group. The burden is on the individual and they must prove that the classification advances no government purpose at all. If the law advances some sort of government uh, purpose, 
then the different treatment stands and those laws are considered constitutional. What about differential treatment based on sex and gender? Should sex and gender be treated as a suspect class classification like race using strict scrutiny as the standard for evaluating laws? Or should sex and gender be treated like a non-suspect classification like age using a rational basis scrutiny as the standard or somewhere in between? The answer is somewhere in between. Laws that differentiate on the basis of sex or gender are given more scrutiny than non-suspect classifications like age, but less scrutiny than race and other suspect classifications. Sex is seen as a quasi-suspect classification, and the court uses the intermediate scrutiny standard when adjudicating laws that differentiate on the basis of sex. To pass intermediate scrutiny, the challenged law must further an important governmental interest and must do so by means that are substantially related to that interest. The cases that you will read for this topic show the legal evolution on gender equality and the Supreme Court. I wanna end this lecture highlighting the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, to whom we owe much for gender equality. I think many of us know the notorious RBG from her 27 years of ex exceptional service on the Supreme Court. Her life before joining, joining the court was equally impressive. Justice Ginsburg was one of nine women in a class of 500 at Harvard Law in the 1950s, juggling the demands of family, motherhood, and law school. She served as the first female member of the Harvard Law Review and became the first female professor at Columbia to earn tenure. Prior to becoming a judge, Ginsburg spearheaded the American Civil Liberties Union Women's Rights Project, leading the fight against gender discrimination and successfully arguing six gender equality cases before the court, um, one of which you'll be reading about this week. We owe a lot to Ruth Bader Ginsburg for furthering the fight for gender equality for both men and women in the United States and beyond.